Hello, this is Ed Spicer and this is www.spicyreads.org. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Zeta Elliott, award-winning author turned self-published author in a video interview that is surprising as well as interesting. Enjoy. So you're saying this is the boulder that inspired Ship of Souls? It did. Because even though I would run in the park for years and I would pass this boulder and I would always think, what if? It would be such a great story if that plaque was actually a door and it opened late at night and there were stairs and some child who happened to be in the park at midnight could go underneath this hill because Prospect Park is partially built on Mount Prospect. So kind of one of the highest points in Brooklyn. Zeta Elliott, welcome to www.spicyreads.org. Would you please tell our viewers about the books you've written? Sure. Hi Ed, thank you very much for giving me the chance to talk about books and thank you for coming to my beloved Brooklyn. We're here in Prospect Park, uh, which is the site of my latest book, Ship of Souls, which is a middle grade reader, speculative fiction and historical fiction. This is my picture book, Bird, that was my first book for kids, published in 2008 from Lee and Lowe Books. As you can see, we won the Honor Award in Lee and Lowe's New Voices contest. Uh, and that's really important to me because I started to write for kids when I was working with children in an after-school program, and I noticed that I was having a really hard time finding books that could serve as mirrors for their lives. In 2008, I also self-published my uh, speculative young adult novel, A Wish After Midnight, which was later acquired by Amazon Publishing in 2010. I love Bird, as you well know. I love Bird because his brother, who has a drug habit, a fix can't be fixed by the younger brother, by his parents, by his families. A Ship of Souls is really a remarkable topic that, haven't, that hasn't often been addressed in any kind of literature. And what do all three of your books share in common? Great question. Well, uh, another one of my um, blogger friends said to me, why are you obsessed with birds? <laughs> And she noticed that that's a recurring motif in my books. Certainly uh, in the picture book Bird, I tried to use overlapping motifs of flight um, to suggest transcendence, uh, liberation. And I also drew upon a West African uh, Adinkra symbol, which is called Sankofa. And Sankofa is uh, sometimes represented by a bird looking back over its shoulder. And in the bird's mouth, is what looks like a ball or a seed or an egg, but my favorite interpretation is that the bird holds in its mouth a gem, a gemstone. And the meaning of Sankofa is that there is no shame in going back to retrieve something of value you left behind. So when I was writing Bird, um, I'm not sure I was conscious of it, but I was actually writing a story about my older brother who had a problem with addiction, which led him to steal from the family and he was incarcerated and like Marcus in the book, who becomes locked out of his family home, uh, we pretty much had to lock my brother out of our lives. And I haven't had contact with my brother in about 14 years. Um, but one of the ways I felt I could go back for something of value in my past was to write this story from the perspective of a child. I was a teenager when all of that happened in my family, but there was still no conversation. My mother refused to acknowledge that my brother had a problem with addiction and theft uh, until it was really too late. So what I see as the recurring theme in my books is this idea of Sankofa. <laughs> I like that. You have mentioned that you self-published a book. Can you tell us a little bit about the reasons behind self-publishing? Because the self-publishing issue is a part of a bigger issue when you say that you needed a book that would be a mirror. Yeah. And would you talk about books as mirror and your self-publishing venture? Sure. I think they're related. They absolutely are related. When I was a child growing up in Canada, uh, I had no books that served as a mirror for me as a black child. I had the picture books of Ezra Jack Keats, and that was about it. 
Uh, Snowy day. Right, there you Great go. Great book. <laughs> uh, and when I was an adolescent, I guess I found Mildred D. Taylor's books, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. The Land. Um, which I love those books, but it wasn't a mirror for my contemporary reality. So even after publishing Bird in 2008 uh, and winning so many awards, I mean, together, Shadra and I, I think we won something close to 10 awards for our first collaboration. And I thought for sure doors would open and I wouldn't have a problem placing my 20 unpublished picture book manuscripts and my chapter books and A Wish After Midnight. I just, I thought for sure it was going to be a question of merit and that people would see that my book, you know, was critically acclaimed and that children loved it and adults loved it. Um, and I still could not place any more of my manuscripts. To me that there's a little bit of a double standard in there because when I look at the history of children's publishing for white America primarily, even if one were to say, oh, Zeta's books are, they're average, okay books, even if they hadn't won awards. How many books do you know that deal with the African burial ground in Central Park? I'm glad you brought that up, and I definitely think that there is a double standard when it comes to writers of color. Um, believe it or not, when I was sending out my manuscript for A Wish After Midnight, which is a time travel story, set in Brooklyn, a 15-year-old Afro-Panamanian girl who makes a wish in the fountain in the Brooklyn Botanic Garden and gets sent back in time to 1863 Brooklyn, middle of the Civil War, New York City draft riots are jumping off, her Rastafarian boyfriend gets sent back with her, and believe it or not, I had an agent say to me, this seems cliche. To some extent, when you're dealing with a publishing industry that, from what I can tell, is about 99% white, you don't have a lot of diversity among ranks of acquisition editors, marketing managers, artistic directors. When you submit um, a query letter, a proposal for a book that, you know, if it makes the editor uncomfortable, they're thinking about their primary target market. So I think if people are, are uncomfortable with certain aspects of history, um, then, it, then a book that is going to explore that history, that's going to require teachers and librarians and parents to have a conversation with children about that history, I think those books end up being hard to sell. I think we see a lot of civil rights movement books because um, a lot of people in America view that as a triumphant narrative, right? Or they want to talk about the aspects of slavery where the Civil War was fought to free the slaves and then everything was wonderful until Dr. King came and then beyond that is <laughs> President Obama was elected and now we're in a post-racial moment. <laughs> so, you know, there's the dominant narrative and then there's what I write about. Once again, that was Zeta Elliott author, scholar, and all around very nice person. Thank you very much, Zeta. I certainly enjoyed all of our time together. And this is Ed Spicer of www.spicyreads.org. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Zeta Elliott. Okay, this is the line of defense for the Battle of Long Island. And tell how this monument factors into the Ship of Souls. Well, one of the interesting things is that, as I said, I had been in the park for years passing that other boulder, and I never even realized that there was a second boulder here commemorating the Battle of Long Island. And I think I'm like most Brooklynites and New Yorkers that, you know, not realizing the first major battle of the Revolutionary War was fought here. As it says, just 175 feet south, that was where the Donegan Oak stood. You can see we have some pretty massive trees still here in the park. Um, and they cut down that oak tree to stop the advance of the Hessians. But the British circled around, uh, and then they had to flee across what is now our Long Meadow um, over to Gowanus. I think there's another memorial site here for some of the young, very young teenage soldiers from Maryland um, who gave their lives trying to hold off the British so that Washington could get over to New York City and then eventually over um, to New Jersey. So there's a lot of history, really important history right here in Brooklyn. All right.